where a farmer's child will come home from school and they'll say, Dad, you're killing the reef, oh right? Can you imagine how that hurts, right? So this is, it's not just an academic debate here. It's hurting real people in a real way. So yeah, very excited to talk to you. I mean, we have so much to cover. Uh, it's a bit late here, but I'll do my best. I'm using some caffeine enhancements and other enhancements. <laughs> uh, so There's not blue sky behind you really, eh? <laughs> no, no, this is, it was snowing last night. Uh, so my joke to my wife was like, well, you know, it's October, it's snowing. I could use a bit of global warming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not to get yeah. right into it, but uh, it's a joke I like making um, whenever it's too cold in Canada. <laughs> yeah, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I don't know if I, like, I have a, like a brief or like a, a rough outline of, of where, like, things I wanted to cover. Um, so, first, kind of start with your background, your story, your kind of initial discoveries of problems uh and then uh your motives values uh and other ways that you're paying your bills updates on your lawsuit against james cook university updates regarding the political uptake uh that you mentioned uh and then the scientific office of quality assurance and the red team approach you mentioned in a, a recent video and which is a nice segue to curate science and what we're trying to do which is actually kind of a, an example uh, integrated quality assurance system where we can ensure and track transparency and uh, credibility of research. Uh, and then maybe finish with next steps in terms of maybe crowdfunding uh, to resume implementation. So we're, we're, you know, we have this system, it's partially implemented, but it's a very big system. Uh, and so you know, we're looking for our next round of funding uh, and so finish off maybe with next steps on crowdfunding uh, to actually be able to get this kind of uh, quality assurance system working um, so that we can check the science. Uh, and and yeah. your case is kind of a, a specific targeted case, uh, but our system would also be designed for kind of random audits, uh, which is exactly how tax audits work. Yeah. Uh, and so we think we want targeted audits for important things, whether it's climate change uh, or, you know, just high impact research that's actually having influence and then do yep. random audits so that even the no name everyday researcher has to think about, have I met, you know, minimum transparency standards? And, and we think that's really, uh, you know, the, the way forward. But uh, yep. so, yeah, let me, you know, maybe start with your background and your story and, and your initial entry into this yeah, well, I've been working on the Great Barrier Reef for 35 years and um, as a physical scientist looking at currents and tides and the way sediment moves around the reef and it came to, in about the 1990s, there was this divergence between those who thought the reef was greatly threatened and, and those who, who of us who don't. And we don't believe, uh, apart from some aspects of the climate change debate, um, a lot of the threats to the reef are greatly exaggerated and we would be writing papers on this which would usually just be ignored. Um, and I'm talking about a serious number of scientists who took a different view, especially on the, the impact of agriculture on the reef. And eventually we ended up getting excluded and, um, well, in the final analysis I started to do audits on the science from the, uh, the opposition and, and we're showing again and again and again how the stuff was just completely wrong. It was just so wrong, it was not funny. Um, but that tended to be ignored. So I then actually started to look at this whole problem of peer review. And, um, and then I realized, well, the problems we've got are almost inevitable because peer review is such a hopeless quality assurance system. And I started to write on that and more or less said in the end that, well, look, if peer review is your only quality assurance system, then it's quite likely that 50% of it is wrong uh, and that can't be regarded as a trustworthy uh, result. And I said that of a particular institution, because they were using just peer review, um, their work couldn't be regarded as trustworthy. <laughs> and that's what got me fired eventually. Huh. So maybe just a few more details about like, like your initial, um, I mean, it sounds like it was pretty abrupt, but, but, 
in terms of identifying problems. Uh, but you know, when you mentioned this to other colleagues, uh, like what are some examples of when you were pushing back at the quality or problems that you were identifying? Uh, the, the, the normal reaction was to try to ignore it. So, for example, we demonstrated that there was a very famous paper that said that coral growth rates, um, which you can measure, that you can measure it like tree rings. You know, tree rings have a right. ring every year. You can drill a hole in a great big coral and you can measure the ring of growth every year and you can measure the growth rates. And you can go back to the uh, 1500s because some of these corals are so big that they, they measure their own growth rates for hundreds of years. And essentially this showed that the coral growth rates rose and then in 1990 they suddenly collapsed. Right? And what had happened was that they'd actually changed their methodology from the day from 1990 up to 2005. And we pointed this out and we, um, we basically made a correction to this, this change and said, well, actually, it, it just kept on going straight. It didn't, it didn't fall at all. Well, they've just ignored that. But worse still, they haven't actually measured that coral growth rate for the last 15 years. So we right, actually I think got, I saw that, yeah. Yeah, we've got data from 1570 to 2005. It's disputed from 1990 to 2005. And from 2005 to the to present, we've got nothing. And I'm saying, well, this is not good enough. You know, we need to check this. We need to update the thing. And why this did they not, stop? No. Like when you asked them, why did they stop collecting or tracking? Well, they sort of don't answer that question. They don't like to answer that question because it's a very embarrassing question. It's like talking about climate change. You know, the temperatures are going up, right? But can you imagine the situation if we didn't have any data on the, in the global climate for the last 15 years? People would be saying, well, why haven't you got this data? If you're saying there's climate change, you better have the data. And they do, of course. But for coral growth rates, we don't have any data for the last 15 years. Now, that's one of many, many problems. The, the biggest one was actually, um, so I, 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 with my colleagues, invented these uh, electronic and optical instruments for measuring sediment around coral reefs and supposedly farmers are smothering uh, sediment coming soil erosion from the farms runs down the rivers and smothers the Great Barrier Reef. And our work for over 20 years has demonstrated this is just not true, all right? And we've been saying this again and again and pointing out how other work was wrong. And basically the, the attitude is just ignore Ridd and Larkham and Orpin and all these other workers w with me. Uh, that's the way it can be done because the group forms and they exclude the others. Peer review is a group forming system. It's almost a guarantee of groupthink. Huh. And so I guess you, you did form groups, um, but were you still kind of in the minority, uh, I suspect? Well, in the 1990s, I think we were probably in the majority, but as the group, the, the group of the doom science formed, we became a minority, uh, and then we were sort of excluded. And maybe, you know, maybe a lot of what we're saying is wrong. I mean, I'm sure some of what, what I've been saying is wrong, um, but I'm absolutely, totally sure that the quality assurance systems that everybody is using are just inadequate. And I'm quite happy to ultimately accept that I'm wrong on a whole lot of stuff, but I'm not prepared to accept that the quality assurance systems we're present we're using are anything but totally inadequate. Right, and that's a great segue because, um, you know, the sign of a scientist is to be open to being wrong and, of course, meeting transparency standards so the science can be checked. Yeah, and so, that's right. so my next question is kind of like your motives and your values. Um, because the, the only when I looked into your case, um, you know, because it almost seemed like what, like, because again, I'm, I'm I'm a psychologist coming from it uh, from a completely different angle, uh, and then there was kind of a, a, a rumor or like you know what is Peter Ridd's motives, and there was something about uh, I think one of your legal cases being partially funded. Uh, by let me get it right the institute of public affairs and yeah. then you know the ipa of course is supporter of the free market and they have funding from mining oil industry yep. right yep. and so um well, i should just let you kind of respond but it's a good segue from saying okay this is science quality assurance uh, and we just want to know the truth 
and everyone's yeah. biased. But how would you respond to these kind of well, critics who say I, you're I, you're maybe funded by you know the 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 oil industry or these yeah, other? Yeah, I love this one. Uh, this is a and um, thanks for allowing me to respond to this because we I get this all the time that supposedly the IPA is this terrible organization that you know I'm sure people in there do have shares in oil. I'm sure my superannuation does too. But I don't get a brass razu from the uh, the IPA. In fact, I'm living at the moment on my wife's superannuation. Uh, when I was working at the university, I never, even though we did a lot of consultancy um, for various companies up the coast working to protect the reef, not a single cent went into um, into my pocket at all. Um, so it's one of these. So the reason that I started to get upset and started to criticize was I just hate to see things that are wrong, right, scientifically wrong, and to see that all these wrong things were happening because there's a fundamental deficiency. But also because in North Queensland, the effect of agriculture on the Great Barrier Reef is a massive economic issue, right? So the farmers are being restricted in what the amount of fertilizer they can apply. Um, they've been accused for killing the reef. And can you imagine what it's like? So for your chill, chill child, literally, this is I've been told this on numerous occasions, where a farmer's child will come home from school and they'll say, Dad, you're killing the reef, oh right? Can you imagine how that hurts, right? So this is, it's not just an academic debate here. It's hurting real people in a real way. And this argument that, oh, well, the, the IPA paid I think $8,000 of my initial legal funds, which now add to $1.7 million. Well, I was going to say, that's so like a very small proportion. It's nothing, yeah. right? So I've had donations from just normal people, mostly people in North Queensland, but a lot of foreigners too, for $1.4 million. I've had to put in $300,000 of my wife's superannuation to, to try to pay the legal fees. Wow. And these guys, these guys are saying... That because the IPA, um, they don't like the politics of the IPA. Somehow, I am a immoral person. But I think it's a joke, right? And it's actually good to clarify because, again, conflicts of interest happen everywhere. As long as you're transparent about them, yeah. then then you can know uh, the full context. And actually, I've been involved in another case. Uh, because as you probably know, uh, with conflicts of interest, you're supposed to disclose anything that could be perceived by other yeah. people as a conflict. Because of course, you, the person, are not in the best position to decide whether it's a conflict of interest or right. not. So it's supposed to be about perceived con conflicts of interest. And there's a big case right now in psychology with a kind of a transparency champion not being transparent about his own conflict of interest. I mean, how dark does that yes. get? Uh, yeah. And so I looked into it because biomedical research tends to be more kind of uh, advanced in these types of questions. Um, and they actually have kind of these numbers of like $10,000. Uh, you know, there, there's kind of a threshold. But again, to be safe, you should just disclose any perceived conflicts of interest uh, for the reader. Uh, and then again, with yeah. minimum transparency, uh, and replication, then you know the, the evidence is there. You can go and check it out, right? Uh, but you need yeah. to be able to meet a transparency standard for both the methodology and for conflicts of interest and your funding sources. Yeah, t t I totally agree. And that you know, I mean, yes, we've had a, a bit of support from the IPA. It's not like I've ever hidden it. Um, and but it's it's worthwhile that people know that. I uh, I think the Institute of Public Affairs are very proud. They want people to know. They chipped in a very little bit of cash right at the beginning when I was going to give up. You know, I was thinking, well, how can I take on a university? And they supplied a law and we thought, well, we can win this. And they're proud of that. And I'm not going to hide that. But it is worthwhile that people know yeah. that, yes, uh, it's a free market organisation. It's uh, <laughs> the, the funny thing about the IPA is that people on the left of politics seem to re regard it as a neo-Nazi organisation. <laughs> Which is just crazy. It's just crazy. Certainly they're right of centre, they're free market. I don't agree with quite a lot of the things they say, but I agree with a, a whole lot of the other stuff. Um, but they're not an evil organisation. Yeah, that gets to the woke culture, which we might get into later. But um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's that's good. So maybe um, updates on the, the, the lawsuit. I guess uh, James Cook University uh, appealed 
uh, the decision and won. And so where is it standing now? Yeah, so we won the first round. Uh, we then lost the appeal 2-1. So essentially we've got more or less two judges in our favour, two judges against us. And now we've appealed to go to the High Court. There's no guarantee that we'll go to the High Court. The High Court is the highest uh, judge in the land. It's like the Supreme, the Supreme Court, Court in yeah. America. Uh, we will probably know before Christmas if we've got if we will succeed in that, and then we will the, the actual case if we if we succeed in getting to the High Court uh, will be sometime next year. But in the meantime, in fact, just yesterday, um, the federal government, Commonwealth government. Uh, has introduced legislation into the parliament to bolster this whole academic freedom problem. Mm. And one of the comments that the minister made was, uh, I can't remember the exact words, but basically um, if this law had been in place a, a couple of years ago, then JC would not have been able to, to prosecute Peter Ridd. So he's actually been quite specific. Wow, that's uh, good. But, of course, it doesn't help me because we're fighting on what the law was in 2018, so we've still got to fight it the way it was. But nevertheless, I think it's a, it's a huge um, moral victory yeah. for us, even, the, even if ultimately we lose the, um, the, uh, the strict legal case. Because there's two things here. There's the strict legal case, which is about two lines in a, you know, a 300-word <laughs> enterprise agreement, and there's the moral case. Was this right or was it wrong? You know, and everybody, almost everybody, including a lot of my scientific opponents, think that what happened was wrong. Um, but it may have been legal. But those are different things. Right. And actually beyond moral, because it's a publicly funded university, uh, it, it becomes kind of a taxpayer accountability issue. So JCU as, a, as receiving public funds uh, you know, should be held to a higher standard for the taxpayer. Uh, and the fact that they spent uh, taxpayer money to appeal your decision is, is, is almost more, even more egregious than the initial uh, action. That's right. And of course, that's why there is there's substantial outrage. I mean, in, in North Queensland, there is great outrage. People will stop me literally in the street and say, how just disgusted they are about what JCU did. Yeah. I mean, even there's a guy, unfortunately, he, he died just a, a few months ago, um, a guy called John Brody, who we've been fighting about the reef for 20 years. He thinks the reef is badly damaged. I don't think it is. Amazingly, on most other things, we just agree, right? We agree on everything. We've both jumped grumpy old man. Yeah. He's gone now. But he went on national television uh, and said, that what they did to me was wrong. Now, JCU employed him, and he went on television and said that his employer did the wrong thing to his most strident scientific opponent. Me. You know, this is what's happened, that people really do believe in the free speech and they do believe that we've got to get the quality right about science. There's a groundswell on these two things. And maybe just briefly uh, explain what, the grounds or what JCU, what grounds did they use uh, to fire you? Uh, essentially, I broke the code of conduct because I uh, brought the university into disrepute by damaging its reputation and I wasn't polite enough in the way that I said what I said. But our point is that if, if you're saying, basically I was saying that uh, an institution within the university had insufficient quality assurance and therefore its work couldn't be regarded as trustworthy. And I had a lot of evidence for where they'd got things wrong and I was basically using the fact that peer review wasn't good enough and all the literature that, that demonstrates that. And my question to JCU is how can I possibly say to an institution, you guys are, don't have enough quality assurance on your work for us to really trust work, uh, to really trust it. How can you say that in a way that they're not going to get upset? Plus, wouldn't that be unpre unprecedented? I mean, I, I've never heard of someone like a tenured professor uh, being fired under those well, grounds, right? I mean, is that... Um... There's a lot of tenured professors who are being fired and excluded for things which are not, not exactly the same. Um, but basically for saying things that other other people find upsetting. 
or de- or a perceived right, damage the political, to reputation. Uh, of the university. Correctness. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I I think if you look around the world at the moment, there are literally dozens of examples of um, tenured academics who are being silenced for what they are saying. Yeah. Actually, one so- the- social psychologist, Lee Jessam, actually, um, who I will most likely be a, a guest on the show as well. He he just published a paper, so he's also a social psychologist, and they they right. they compiled a list of recent professors who have been uh, who've lost their jobs or at least been sanctioned for just what they're saying, uh, and yep. uh, and and it does seem to be a, a growing uh, problem. Um, and oh, something else you mentioned is that so initially you were just saying that you were. You were, like you, you had evidence of problems, uh, but then, you, as you just said, you were targeting more the deficiencies of the peer review. But then, weren't yeah. you uh, later kind of vindicated by actual uh, replications that didn't turn out so well? Could you expand on that? Yeah, there's there's been a, a lot of examples um, where where we've been proven to be right. Uh, for example. A paper came out from that very same institution uh, saying that climate change was making little fish lose their sense of smell and be eaten by predators. Um, And there was a couple of other things. I've forgotten exactly what they were. But anyway, it was very bad for little fish. It was the carbon dioxide level changing the pH of the ocean. It was doing this nasty thing to the little fish. Anyway, a group of eight international scientists checked this work, right, and there were close to a dozen papers in all which they checked, right, and they found that none of them replicated. They could not um, get the results of this work at all. So is that just re, uh, and, like, is that just re- reanalyzing the data or doing a new study? No, they actually redid the experiments. So they went out onto the reef and they got the little fish, and there were all sorts of questions. I mean, there's there's even a question mark about whether some of the work was fraudulent because there was supposedly she needed about 150 of these little fish to do the experiment, but the the records said she only had 10. Um, the lady produced this collage of photographs, supposedly saying there were 50 photographs, but quite a few of the pictures are definitely doctored. They're being mirror mm. imaged. Some of the same fish with a slightly different color contrast, but but, you know, there were 10 of these, more than 10 of these papers, and they didn't replicate. And this was the organization which I had said their work is not trustworthy because their quality assurance protocols are not up to it. And here comes a group of eight totally independent scientists who I didn't even know about. And, you know, a year later, say they got none of it right, none of it replicated. So none of this 50% of peer reviewed right is right. And were these papers right. like high impact or were they chosen yes. because they looked weak? No, these were in, I think one was in science or was it in nature? Really? We're talking about really major um, journals that these were in. Okay, so it's not just that they cherry picked these, these really obviously bad papers uh, that, that had no impact. No, no, no. No, and these were these were papers where there were headlines around the world. You know, so you, you can just imagine that uh, climate change makes fish use their smell. Right, right. that's going to go. That's going to be on the Canadian whatever you have. It's going to and it's in the BBC. You can Google this, yeah. and you can see this stuff go all around the world. And it was wrong. Uh, and that's just one example. I can get that the nice example. That's a nice example because it's other scientists demonstrating without exactly. any shadow. Of that. This work was wrong, and um, huh? And it does seem to parallel again problems in psychology, where a lot of these findings are getting what we call sexy. These are sexy findings, which is easy in psychology because I mean, I was in social psychology. I even worked with literally relationship researchers who study sex, right? And so uh, it's uh, you know because it's always been a debate of. Is there something specific about social psychology that's that's broken, or is it systemic? And of course, it is systemic. But I think because the stakes are higher uh, in social psychology, it's easier to study sexy research. And then you got your viral TED talks and your best-selling books. Uh, so the problems yeah. might be slightly worse in fields that you can kind of sexify. 
but now I'm hearing that, yeah, even in marine ecology, you can kind of choose your questions uh, knowing that they will draw a lot of attention. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, I mean, I think that if you're in some fairly dry areas of engineering and physics, uh, things are much more solid. There's still the fundamental problem that peer review is really just a quick pass. You know, the, the experiment isn't redone. The analyses, and you know, you spend a couple of hours and you check it. So peer review is is not, not enough. But there aren't these other sort of ideological uh, things which will come into engineering or dry physics. Uh, but they certainly come into the Great Barrier Reef because of all the political, um, you know, everybody knows the reef is supposedly badly damaged. So, yeah, I'm I'm including it under woke culture, uh, and and yeah. this is why again our these transparency standards need to be applied across all players, uh, and we'll get to it later. But this is why our integrated system. Uh, has developed transparency and replication standards for all players, uh, including journals for peer review and for universities for promotion and hiring and for funding agencies, right? I mean, it's all, yeah. it's, it's all connected. Uh, and so it's an ambitious system, uh, but we think it's just the next step. It's kind of like designing uh, uh, an auditing quality assurance system if science had been invented when the internet already existed right uh yeah and it's just but it's just kind of embodying uh the scientific principles right so when when people talk about curate science like i try to tell them it's 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 an ambitious project but it's it's not anything special we're just embodying the fundamental scientific principles that we all learn in high school and just put it on a website so that all stakeholders can use to ensure that the research is trustworthy right um that's right yeah, I mean, we want science needs to be able to be replicated. You need to be able to get to, to do it. And uh, I actually think that if something's just been through peer review, uh, it should not, it should almost not get into the radio or television or internet news because at the moment, at that point, it's well, it's it's interesting, but it's not it's not necessarily the truth. Uh, and universities are very quick to push this stuff out. Uh, when it has only been through peer review and they don't actually mention to the populace, there's a 50-50 chance this is going to turn out to be wrong. Um, and it's getting and so worse. Actually, Go ahead. Yeah, so they're actually being, um, uh, well, they, they're getting close to lying about whether, about the trustworthiness of their, their QA systems. If, they, if they're making out that peer review is something that it's not, then actually they're not necessarily telling the truth. Yeah, but I was going to say it's actually worse, unfortunately, because now with preprints, so the preprint revolution, yeah. uh, in a ironic way, um, has made it worse because universities now there's, uh, can basically start promoting and marketing uh, research that have just been released on preprints. So that's not even peer review, right? Uh, never mind whether it meets uh, transparency standards. And there was a case with with COVID at University of Oxford, where you know yeah. they started disseminating this early uh, research, and, and it, it becomes a liability. I mean, this is uh, and so again, it's kind of strange that I mean, I was the biggest supporter of preprints because the idea is well, if you have something credible, of course you want to start disseminating it as soon as possible and not wait for this really uh, glacial peer review system, right? But again, if your research is picked up by the media or is, has medical implications, then preprints are actually potentially very dangerous. Well, that, they are, but I don't have a problem with preprints. Uh, the, the problem is that the media have been told the peer review is something that it isn't. Uh, so, I mean, they think that it, it means that the work is correct. Uh, so that if we were a bit more honest about what peer review meant, then a preprint, which has not even been through that, people will look at that and say, well, well, it's interesting. They'll look at it if it's peer reviewed and, well, it's a bit more interesting, but it's not true until, well, it's not close to being true until we've we've got, you know, three or four people have re redone the experiments and we've re really now nailed this. So the problem comes down to lying about what peer review actually means and the media will just take it and print it as though it's gospel when it's not. Yeah. The problem, the problem is not that it's wrong, right? The problem is not that it's wrong. 
The problem is that we've been telling people that it's it's more likely to be true than it really is. That is the big worry here. Yeah. And uh, and as you said, uh, transparency is the key, but but peer review uh, should be kind of just a preliminary check. And so there's kind of a hierarchy of standards uh, where you still might think, okay, a preprint by biomedical researchers at Stanford should still count more than a blog post by a, a random crystal yeah. uh, ball healer, uh, but it's still not peer reviewed. And then with peer review, again, if you don't have access to the data, then it hasn't really withstood scrutiny uh, because I yeah. totally agree. In peer review, most of the time, the data is not even accessible or reanalyzed, right? And I actually don't even think that necessarily we should. I mean, that's a debate to be had, whether peer reviewers should be forced to check the data and reanalyze the data. Like, I think that, especially if it's not paid, uh, that's kind of too onerous. And again, that's why we need a tracking system where, okay, it's peer reviewed, but where's the data? And where are the reanalyses? Where are the replications? And we need to track that and organize that so that we can look this up before we start putting too much weight in these findings. That, that's true. Now, transparency is really important, but it's not everything. You need, you've got to have it, but you've got to have more than that. We almost sort of need a, a star rating, you know, Michelin star rating in um, science. A blog post by some scientist, one star. If it's been peer reviewed, two stars. If it started to have a few people getting the same result, three stars, you know, uh, Newton's laws of motions, five stars. It's just replicated so many times. So you look at the the layers of quality assurance and slowly you get more and more uh, confidence that it's it's likely to be right. And and that's what we that's what we need. And um, and most science, it actually doesn't matter whether it's wrong. I, I think that. Something like 20 to 30 percent of scientific papers don't have a single citation. So who cares if it's wrong? But then there's this other science, say, on the, the stuff which, which I'm looking at at the Great Barrier Reef, which is really affecting people. Government policies are being made on it. Now, that's where you need much more than peer review. You need it to be, uh, whereas a peer review doesn't have the time or the money to do the replication, you need to pay money to get that replication done by two or three groups. Uh, if you're going to now enact legislation, which is going to cost the industry billions of dollars uh, and really affect livelihoods. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's definitely true. So maybe, uh, oh, I guess I want to talk about the updates uh, regarding the political uptake uh, in uh, Northern Queensland. Uh, do you mean with regard to the reef or with the quality assurance um, stuff? Uh, the reef, yeah. Just a... yeah. yeah, so um, it, it, on, on the reef, there's been we're having an election now on uh, on, on Saturday, and the reef has become a, a, a an election issue. The farmers are are pushing for a lot of quality checking to be done on the sites. They're not saying it's all wrong. Nobody's saying that. Um, but they do think that some of it definitely doesn't look right and they want it to be checked before before uh, more legislation comes down. Uh, so that's become a significant political issue in North Queensland. And how did you reach out to them or how did that develop? Uh, sort of, it happened sort of, they were reading the stuff I was producing. Remember, I'm from a, an agricultural area. I come from Innisfail, just north of here. and surrounded by sugarcane farms and banana farms and cattle properties. So I know a lot of people in the agricultural industry. And slowly we started to work together, unpaid, right? So uh, transparency, completely unpaid. Um, though a lot of farmers have been paying, have been uh, donating to my legal fund. So there we are, there's a, a disclosure too. <laughs> uh, but I, I really worry about these farmers being, un, in my view, unfairly criticised for killing the reef when they, in some of these things, are just ridiculous. I mean, the reef is about 100 kilometres from the coast, and our work has shown that the sediment, you know, we invented the instruments to measure sediment. We've got more measurements of sediment than all the other groups put together, right? And we were demonstrating it doesn't get out to the reef, and even the inshore reefs, it has negligible effect. And yet in all the major statements, they're saying the farmers are smothering the reef, the farmers are putting the reef at risk. 
And that sort of annoys us, it annoys the farmers, and they finally started to do something politically. So, but it sounds pretty uh, surprising. Like, how come they didn't, ex- like, how come they didn't anticipate that they were going to receive strong pushback by you and other people who, as you say, I mean, you've invented some of these instruments. Uh, you're clearly a visible uh, person, a researcher. Like, how come they didn't? anticipate pushback or because they can just ignore the minority uh so because we are a minority of the people thinking that these threats are exaggerated uh they can just ignore you and you know for example up until 2006 i was you know a bit of a heavy hitter getting government research grants i'd get lots of government money but when i started to come out to say I reckon some of this is wrong. In fact, I actually put in a grant application asking to do some replication tests on some of this uh, reef science. <laughs> Suddenly my uh, <laughs> government fund dried up, right? <laughs> it didn't matter because I did a quite a lot of commercial stuff and we made a re- reasonable profit on that and that was able to um, supplement, you know, drive PhD students and do a whole lot of things. But it was, that's what will happen. That's what peer review of the, not only the papers, but of the funding does. We shouldn't call it peer review. We should call it, you know, group think maker. That's what it does, right? <laughs> well, I'm about to release a big uh, whistleblow on the Canadian government, uh, the three main funding agencies in Canada for gross mismanagement. And one of the biggest mismanagement uh, examples that I'm uh, disclosing is uh, basically like it it's it's like as you say i mean that it, it's peer review but worse it's like a like grant review is like a v- worse version than than peer review <laughs> which yeah. is already really yeah. bad it's it's basically just opaque group think and other conflicts of interest and other old boys networks and yeah. and so it it uh it's it's really and it, and again this is billions of dollars in canada i mean they're spending like two and a half billion per year and they've been doing this for you know 30 40 years or more um and you know it's it's pretty pretty sad and uh it speaks to um so you said you when you started proposing to do replications <laughs> your your funding oh, that was right very up. interesting uh because yeah, yeah. that's something we propose so we don't just propose like minimum transparency standards that granting agencies should ensure their grantees meet we're also proposing that funding agencies earmark a certain percentage of the funds for replication research. Actually, there's two different ways. Anyways, there's, and, and so we want to build that in the system, right? And, and it's consist, yeah. fully consistent with, the, with, with what you're saying. You spend, you know, maybe $5 million to check the science to make sure the $2 billion worth of research investment is, uh, you know, actually useful, right? Yeah, that, that, that's right. So, for example, for the reef, we estimate we could do a replicate, good replication study for $5 million, which is nothing. It's about 1% on what we're supposedly going to spend to save the reef in the next few years. For the Australian Research Council, I'm suggesting that 5%, sounds like your number, 5% of the uh, funds of the Australian Research Council should go on replication studies. But you know what happened when I proposed putting a grant uh, application to do replication study on some of this Great Barrier Reef work? It came back saying, this is against the funding rules because because the... And they were right. I mean, you get back these reviews back and you think, I, I'm actually, I'm scuppered here because you look at the research rules and it says that they will only fund new work, right? And they, they came back and saying, well, this is not new work. You're just going to replicate <laughs> old work. So it's actually against the funding rules. Now, they made other comments about, well, the, the views of writ about the reef are well known. So they clearly were very happy that they could exclude me on that basis. But they were right. According to the ARC, the Australian Research Council funding rules, and they're the same now as they were in 2007, so I checked just a, a couple of months ago, you cannot fund replication studies from the Australian Research Council. It's illegal. Right. Um but luckily it's changing and though in the US like i know lots of people that uh know people at the NSF and and they 
they are told, oh, yeah, this is a great idea, but, you know, we're such a large bureaucracy. Like, we can't do anything. We're going to change. It's, it's going to take a long time to change. And uh, and so and so that's what we're hoping in Canada and other European countries. So here's some positive developments. Because, um, you know, Netherlands, Belgium, France, they're they're kind of at the forefront for open access laws, which we're trying to duplicate uh, in Canada and we should join forces for Australia as well. Yeah. Um, but they also in the Netherlands specifically, so the main NWO, it's called, I think they actually now yeah. are funding is one of the rare funding agencies, public funding agencies that are funding replication and uh, reanalyses. So reproducibility reanalyses, which just means, you know, taking the data and making sure you can reproduce the results, which, which, our system integrates because it's, as you just said, uh, replication is very expensive. And so the first step should be, can you, it really depends on, I guess, the area of research, but if reproducibility is feasible, then it makes more sense to attempt that before an expensive replication, right? Because if you can't reproduce the results from the data, then it's probably not worth doing replication, right? No, no that's right. Uh, but it's not expensive. It's actually dirt cheap because you don't need to try to replicate every paper in every journal. You, there's certain papers which are very important. I actually use this term policy science, which is the science that's used for public policy. Um, that those are the those are the papers that you need to really check, and the amount that it costs is is uh, is minuscule. You know, if if a, a scientific paper is going to be used in engineering, um, a company will check it, and they do. So medical uh, drug companies, they will check the work coming out of the university. The first thing they'll do is try to replicate it. They find it's usually wrong, and they move on, right? So it's not a problem. Um, but governments, for some reason, will just accept peer-reviewed work as though it's gospel. And that, those are the ones which we need to check. And it's not very much. And it's not very many. And it's quite remarkable, you know, I've talked to a lot of politicians and there is certainly a push in both the, at the state and federal level uh, of our sort of slightly right of centre party. It's called the Liberal, the Liberal Party, but it's slightly right of centre hmm. um, to actually make this office of what I call Office of Science Quality Assurance, which would do replication tests on policy science. Well, that's the next question. So that's a good segue, uh, maybe give more details about what you have in mind with this quality assurance office? Yes. So um, we believe that this office, um, I mean, we're up for um, suggestions, but one suggestion is that it should operate within the Auditor General's department, not the Department of Science, because the auditor knows about independence. If somebody's going to review a piece of work and redo the experiments, you want to make sure they are independent. Um, you'd you'd have a group of a sort of a, a panel of people who might have referred to them a, a big issue. So in my case, it would be the Great Barrier Reef. Are farmers killing the reef with sediment or fertilizer? You would then ask the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority to provide the main scientific evidence and the papers which underpin the legislation on that. We're only interested in stuff where there's legislation. The rest we don't care about. Um, because this is a government checking the science upon which they are making legislation. Uh, and then, all right, in the case of the Great Barrier Reef, um, I estimate there's about a dozen or 20 papers. The head of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority reckons there's about 20, uh, 12. And we're going to go and check those, right? And it will cost five million bucks. So the problem is how do you make sure that that organisation doesn't get captured by the people who it's trying to audit. And this is why it's important that you don't go through the Department of Science because the Department of Science will just believe the Australian Institute of Marine Science, whatever they say. But the Auditor General knows about independence and capture. Huh. And, and so you also mentioned the red team, blue team approach. Um, how would that fit in yep. there? Well, this is a red team. It's a red team. The Office of Science Quality Assurance, it's not trying to decide what is right and wrong, right? That's the first thing. It doesn't say Peter Reid is right, the Australian Institute of Marine Science is wrong. What it does is it says we have a, a piece of work, coral growth rates, the Australian Institute of Marine Science has said something, 
we've gone off and, and uh, checked this work. We find the following errors, right? And people can look at that and say, all right, well, the errors were, they were errors, but they weren't important errors, and um, we're going to believe the Australian Institute of Marine Science. So some of the politicians need to make that decision. But the, the uh, Office of Science Quality Assurance puts up a red team to fight the blue team, and then we sit back and we look at this, watch the fight, and say, I'm with the red team or I'm with the blue team. But what it does is it forces the debate. It forces the argument. It stops the groups forming. It actually, it actually tries to smash the groups is what it does. And But how are they going to find the red team? The red teams? Right. So that's the question. How are you going to make sure the red team is really red, right. not blue, dressed in red? Yeah. <laughs> that's the crucial thing, right? Uh, look, I think you need to have it so that the, the people on this Office of Science Quality Assurance understand about the deficiencies of peer review and of groupthink. Um, we have an a, a Australian Nobel Prize winner um, who discovered that stomach ulcers were caused by a bacteria. Now, he's very interesting because when he first proposed this, the peer group said, you're completely crazy, right? It's well known that the acidity of the stomach is so high that no bug can ever grow in there, right? And he was he was like Peter Ritt except in spades, right? Nobody believed him. He was ostracized. So what he did is, well, he took this bug and he gave himself a stomach ulcer and then he cured it with tetracycline and bismuth or something and, and he cured it. And within a few years, everybody realized, well, he was right. And now he is a He's got a Nobel Prize. You can't get more part of the establishment than that. But that guy understands what the peer group will do to you. Now, there are other, there are lots of other scientists around, not quite so spectacular, but know what the peer group will do. They've gone through a phase in their career where they were on the wrong side of it, but now they are respectable scientists. We need people like that who, on the board, who can select the people to do the actual work. They don't do the actual work, but they understand the problem of independence and of the peer group, and they would be good people to select the actual red team. Right, and then it feeds into transparency standards again as a necessary yeah. but insufficient condition yeah. where we need transparency in terms of their conflicts of interest, their funding sources, their author contributions, all these kind of basic checks. Exactly. Uh, because sometimes... You know, they might look like a red team on on the surface, but you know, yeah. there might be other things, and um, so and then yeah, there might be difficulty. Like, what happens if they can't? I guess it just goes on. Like, if they can't find uh, people, because that's something that uh, I mean, in psychology, it, it it's generally easier. Well, no, actually, it's not always easier. That's that's another part. Um, is that People initially were saying, "Oh, you're, you know, you're, the replication movement is is picking on obviously poor research, and the more the research that's more difficult to replicate uh, is not being targeted." Uh, but um, in but but in other ways, difficult like longitudinal marital <laughs> studies, uh, you know, they're probably going to be even less replicable. Because they're so expensive, or like baby studies, uh, you know, like so, uh, or neuroscience studies, and now there are growing. Like there's not as many replications uh, in those areas, but now there's starting to be some, and it's generally not working out so well either. Well, I I think the idea that replication is expensive, I just can't agree that replication is is ever expensive unless you do the replication. You've got nothing. It, it, Science, science relies on replication, and if it doubles the price to make it reliable, then you've got to double the price, right? I mean, right, but most, if it's a marital study that's research, 10 years, like if it's a 10-year study, like, like you're right, the standards should still be met, but it is harder to do a, a replication of a 10-year marital, marital study. Yeah, you can't go back 10 years and do that. I, I accept that, but we can do it again from this year and, and move on, right? So... There are almost there's almost nothing that you can't replicate in some way or test in some way. Um, the, the fundamental problem is that there's no commitment to even try. Uh, we just believe peer review, or we pretend we believe. Most people don't actually believe peer review, yeah. but they will say they do, and the institutions will say. 
Yeah, the only exception being, again, really more from social psychology is that there are temporal or historical uh, confounds. And so they will cite, uh, like, for example, like a terrorist attack. So social psychologists would study the response to the 9-11 terrorist attacks yeah. in the U.S. And they would use that as a kind of an excuse to not have to do replication. But of course, I agree with you. And uh, it's actually kind of like the corroboration of Einstein's uh, special relativity of the deflection of the curvature of light. Like you can't necessarily do replication at will any time, but you can specify the conditions of what solar eclipse or lunar eclipse is required to observe the effect, right? And so I would counteract to those researchers, well, you'd have to be able to specify what characteristics of a terrorist attack where you would expect the effect to replicate. And if you're not willing to at least put something down, right, then it's not falsifiable. And if it's not falsifiable, then it's not science, right? But, but we can all admit that social psychology gets to the limits of what science is even possible because there's so many things changing. There's so many moving parts, right? Uh, True, but may, maybe one of the problems with, you know, working out, um, you know, the nine, say the 9-11 attack, you can't go back to 2001 and, and do a, a survey of what people feel about it. But maybe people have to look about this uh, right from the beginning and say, well, if we're going to have anything that we can hang our hat on, we've got to actually build the replication, the replication right at the beginning, that we are going to have two or three groups who are going to try to measure the same hmm. thing. But they're going to do it separately, and they may even use slightly different um, systems. That That is the way you have to do it for those sort of time-dependent things. But, you know, most of science, I mean, everything that I'm involved with on the Great Barrier Reef and most of the climate change, well, some of the climate change stuff is a bit problematic. You can't go back to... Well, I was going to say, yeah. Temperature. But you can, there's all sorts of proxies for it. Um, so there is most of the things you can actually... Um, dream up a replication thing. But if you can't, then if you start a survey in 2001, then you need to build replication into it right at the beginning. Yeah, and that's a great point that uh, just like transparency, you have to kind of build transparency into the study uh, and you should al already be thinking about replication as yeah. you're conducting uh, the study. And That's right. Um, but again, the academic system incentives are completely... Uh, misaligned with that goal because that means your research is going to take longer, more effort. Uh, and so, again, so all these great ideas that can never really happen because the incentives no. are completely misaligned. Well, you're right about the incentives. I mean, one of the problems with all this is that it's going to prove a whole lot of people are wrong. <laughs> and the last thing that an institution or a scientist wants is to be proven to be wrong. I mean, at the moment, um, you see, for our Office of Science Quality Assurance, it will be very public failure if it's wrong, right, because legislation is coming in, it's going to go up on a website, the Australian Institute of Marine Science or whatever made a terrible mistake. Um, it's not going to be buried in some little note at the back of some journal, some little errata that everybody can ignore. This is going to be public humiliation, and that's what we need. And, of course, one of the main things of having this institutionalized red team is that it will suddenly fix up a whole lot of bad behavior because there is a chance you could get caught it's like all laws you can go i can go speeding out on the road but if there's no policeman there to catch me we'll all go speeding on the road but if there's a bit of a chance i can get caught well you know we might play it safe and at the moment scientists get away with producing rubbish and there's almost no uh, reputational damage to that uh, and we've got to make sure there is some reputational damage. You get it wrong, especially when it's affecting real people, um, which in, in the case of the reef stuff, it really is. Then there needs to be um, consequences of getting it wrong. Yeah. And then the random audits that I mentioned previously uh, also helps with kind of all of the rest of the researchers who you know are not impactful, but it's still a general research culture where there needs to be a perception that uh, that you might get caught uh, if you're yeah. not uh, being careful enough. And actually, even just this show, uh, I've gotten a lot of flack for calling out people. Like I mentioned about like the transparency champion, uh, Brian Nosek, not being transparent. 
with his own conflicts of interest. And, but I try to explain to them, yeah, but it's it, like you just said with the law. I mean, if, if we're not enforcing, because minimum transparency turns out to be not just uh, a practical definition of science, but it's also an ethical issue, uh, which a lot of yeah. people don't realize. But if you read these codes of conduct, research integrity documents, um, the Netherlands is one of the better ones. Uh, they actually specify that transparency and you can say minimum transparency is a core ethical principle, right? And if we're yeah. not enforcing it, then then those codes of conduct have no teeth, right? And That's so right. by me going out on Twitter and making these videos saying, how come these transparency champions are not being transparent? This is a problem. This is not bullying. This is not harassment. This is me just trying to change the system. And by just the existence of this show, uh, might help because other people might think, oh, I don't want to end up being talked about on the Saving Science show if I, I exactly. get caught not being transparent, right? Yep. And, you know, it's uh, it's unfortunate, but who else is going to self-police academics? Um, I mean, the government should be doing a better job, uh, but they're not. And so in the meantime, someone has to step in. Well, that's right, and you're doing a good job. But and um, what we should be encouraging is your Canadian and my Australian research council. You know, five percent, ten percent. You spend it on replication, and uh, uh, it would be absolutely fabulous. The effect of it would be immediate uh, in terms of people being much more careful with their own publications. Yeah. So maybe just to wrap up, um, and so your vision, what you just described of your quality assurance, the red blue team approach again, fits very well with Curate Science. Uh, and so um, we can definitely join forces there uh, because it's it's basically a way just to organize all the information. So, um, and as I said, it's an integrated system to verify, ensure, and track the transparency and credibility of research for researchers, journals, universities, and funding agencies. And so, for example, in your targeted case, uh, when you find the red teams and then they do the replication, then all that information can be posted. And so each article will be able to show any reanalyses or replications of effects in that paper and then even critical commentaries. Because again, credibility yeah. is three, at least three different things. It's just critical commentaries that criticize maybe the, even just the design of the research, which some people call post-publication peer review, which is perpetual activities of science. And then reanalyses that look at just repeating the reanalyses on the data and make sure you can get the same results. And then robustness, uh, which is doing other analyses that are also justifiable because typically in a study, there's more than one way to analyze the data. Yeah. So robustness actually yeah. tests, if we do the statistical analyses uh, in other justifiable ways, do we get similar results? And then there's replication. Yeah. Uh, and so that's at the article level, but then we'll also have collections where uh, you organize replications of effects that are on a similar topic. Um, and then you have the researcher level where you could look up to see the transparency track record of researchers. And yeah. it's both carrots and sticks. I mean, I, I agree with carrots uh, and, and rewarding good behavior. But at this point, uh, I think we also need to get the sticks out and 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 with the random audits, that's kind of what it's going to be. Unfortunately, a, a kind of a wall of shame, where um, you can look at people, uh, at researchers who have not uh, been transparent or are not sharing their data and don't have valid exemptions, and uh, it's a bit kind of like fraud investigations, uh, yeah. where there there is a wall of shame. Where you, though, actually, there's a lot of room for improvement. Netherlands again being on the forefront. Canada has a terrible system where they're keeping the names. This is part of my disclosure, which I'm sending tomorrow to 20 vice presidents and presidents of all funding agencies tomorrow. Uh, they are keeping the names of convicted fraudsters private due to privacy laws. Can you imagine? Uh, like, yeah, So yeah. this guy wrote an article saying Canada is the best place to be a fraudulent researcher <laughs> because there's basically no punishment. And those people can continue usually with their industry-sponsored uh, projects uh, and or even get other jobs in other countries. So these fraudulent researchers, you know, they can just carry on. And so we propose that they should have uh, 
basically a public uh, list of researchers who have been convicted. And we might even go further saying that even if you're cleared of wrongdoing, uh, potentially your name should be public because the bar is already so high. The, the threshold yeah. to even initiate a fraud investigation is so high that I think even if you're cleared of wrongdoing, the public should know that you've been investigated. I, I, I agree. I, I have no problem with somebody. If somebody puts up a, a, something against me, I would want to see the the, the clearance also uh, be out there. But, you know, don't, don't you think that us scientists are the most um, untrustworthy profession there is, full stop, I mean, I say, who is more tr untrustworthy? I mean, you're saying we can't even publish the name of convicted frauds, right? 50% of the, the stuff that we produce is wrong. I mean, used car salesmen, they have a bad reputation, right? But more than 50% of the cars you buy in a used car lot actually work. So I actually look at us as the most shameful <laughs> profession that there is on the planet at the moment, and we've really got to do something about that. But the public don't seem to realize it yet, but they're going to know and they're starting to smell, yeah. by the way, that there are problems. No, exactly. And that's very well put. And I use actually an analogy from the financial industry uh, where in 2002 in the US, uh, after the huge scandal with Enron and WorldCom involving yeah. corporate fraud uh, due to lack of transparency, there was a huge milestone where they passed uh, what's called the Sarbanes Oxley Act. And I cite it in my videos that transformed and raised the transparency standard for all publicly traded companies in the US. Uh, yeah. and, and that's basically what we need. So, and, and that's what I tell people, scientists should already, like our standards of transparency for scientists should be uh, a lot higher than for bankers and for corporate types that we, you know, like the, the stereotype, oh, he's just a greedy business person. Uh, yet their transparency standards are higher than the transparency standards in yeah. academia. Uh, and so yeah, definitely this needs to be changed. And uh, it, it's just completely upside down. I mean, uh, but I guess it's just a gradual corruption of the system that uh, is getting worse over time. And then the, the players are colluding. And, and this is not a, a conspiracy theory. Um, I have this diagram that shows how... Uh, because when I tell this to people, usually, you know, and, you know, rightfully they are shocked. Um, but I try to tell them that these players uh, are kind of colluding knowingly or unknowingly to perpetuate this broken system because they're benefiting. Right. So if you think about, yep. uh, you know, big time professors and then the journals that just want attention and media attention and then the universities, they want patents and they want funding and big grants and media attention and then the publishers, right? So it's a broken system, uh, deeply broken system at all levels in foundational aspects. But these players still are benefiting from this broken system. Uh, but it's the taxpayer uh, who's getting the shaft again. Uh, and yeah. And just other researchers that are true scientists. So, and and I make sure to yeah. mention that uh, I still believe that the silent majority of researchers uh, in academia are good researchers, honest researchers that are trying their yeah. best. Uh, but they are they they don't have the impact, right? But if you have a system where they can meet the standards. And then we redefine the rules and then everyone can be at an equal playing field rather than, you know, the 20, 30 percent of dopers. Oh, that's another analogy I use. It's like cycling okay. and doping. If you're not using academic steroids, you can't even compete at the top. And yeah. the steroids in our case are just, you know, the sloppy, questionable research practices that you can hide without transparency standards. Right. Yeah. Um, no, look, you, you're right. Um, we've got a, almost all scientists, uh, they're good people doing the best they can, but we're all operating in a system with these terrible flaws. That it, it, the, the, all the, the systems which should check the work and make sure it's right, they don't, they're, not, they're not operating. Um, so it's almost inevitable that happened. And I think your analogy with the doping, you know, Tour de France type, type stuff, if you're in a system that is corrupt, well, what can you do? Uh, you've got to fix the system, and that's what we've got to do with um, with science.
Great. So maybe the last thing about how do we make this happen uh, in terms of implementing this uh, system? Um, like, what are your plans for funding? Uh, like you're, you said, you're thinking it should be part of the Auditor General, but who's going to be funding yeah. the activities and who's going to actually fund the replication costs? and all the checking well the, the, the costs are just trivial i mean as i say for the reef it's not even one percent of what we're spending right it's not even one percent of what we're spending on the science let alone all the other things right so the cost is negligible it's more of a political thing where you've got to convince the world uh the, the populace that there is a problem with replication and general unreliability of the scientific systems uh because Politicians are very wary about being branded a denier, right? So if you say, oh, there's a problem with the science, then they'll, they start thinking climate change or something like that, and you're a denier, so you might be a bad person. So you've got to keep away from that. But, but we're talking about, in most cases, not things even quite so controversial as climate change. So the Great Barrier Reef is getting up there. Um, so it's trying to give the politicians a little bit of political coverage to demonstrate again and again and again that, you know, the, the Dutch uh, scientific uh, funding body, as you said, is funding replication, so why don't we do it? Um, what is, who, who would possibly argue with a little bit more checking of the science that's affecting every farmer in North Queensland, uh, every mine in North Queensland, and is also affecting the tourist industry in North Queensland, so every industry full stop. Why wouldn't we check the science? So these are the sort of arguments which we're using and I have, I have not much doubt that in the next five years, we will have a red team of some description operating either at Queensland State or at the Commonwealth Australian level. Okay, so it's convincing, the, yeah, so it's convincing the state or the federal uh, to yeah. fund this office. Um, yeah. and then, but maybe in the meantime, um, we could do a crowdfunding uh, a smaller scale crowdfunding initiative to to start doing the random audits as I was talking about, and then you're kind of maybe going bottom up, top down, right? Uh, because for our system, uh, like just kind of like the existence of this show, is if people know that our system is up and running, even though it's kind of uh, a smaller um, kind of subset, um, we because we're basically uh, in between funding. So we just had a quarter million dollar grant from the European Commission to design the system and to start implementing it. And we've actually implemented the researcher part. So we'd actually have uh, what we're calling Curate Scholar, which is basically just like Google Scholar, which everyone uses, but with transparency compliance. So you can actually put links to your data, links to your conflict of interest disclosures, uh, and then everyone gets a page and you can link to the full text PDF and have all this uh Nice stuff. So there's there's actually self selfish benefits to curating the transparency of your papers, but now we need to continue implementing the other parts of the system, so that uh, universities, funders, and journals uh, can use the system. Uh, and so we're thinking a crowdfunding uh, bottom up approach might uh, might be useful. Yeah, it, it might be. I don't know how crowdfunding would go on that. Crowdfunding works when people are emotional. They have to be upset, angry, or, or something like that to do it, uh, to get money from them. But, you know, to me, this is the, the, the problems with science are, are really only a problem if the science is going to be used and only by governments because the commercial sector will, will check that their stuff. Uh, so ultimately, it's up to the government to check the science which they're using. And don't worry about the rest, right? Uh, and so I'm not, yes, I think it'd be interesting to do a, a crowdfunding, but we've got to convince the government of the problems. Right. And then your five million, uh, does that include actually developing the system, the compliance system, tracking system? No. No, so five million, that's just for the Great Barrier Reef, right. right, which is our biggest environmental problem, supposedly. Uh, that's just to actually do some of the main experiments again, uh, to do the analyses again. It's not very much money. It's just a drop in the bucket, actually. Because that could be another angle. So, you, so you're so you pushing for five million to, to do the checking for the Great Barrier Reef specifically, 
But then you also mentioned, well, if you want, you can also chip in to developing uh, this compliance system that can be used for any area of research. And then Australia oh, yeah. can become a world leader because politicians, they love to say, kind of like the Netherlands, that they're at the forefront, right? And actually Canada, this is why it's embarrassing for tomorrow when I'm sending this. Canada, has, if you go under government, they're all the, the open government and open data. Even on the funding agencies, they go on and on about transparency, but it's just empty promises, right? But mm. if you can angle it a certain way, you say, if you invest in this uh, quality assurance system, you are becoming the world leader of uh, transparency and credibility, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's right. I mean, you, you're no doubt you're no doubt right about that. But the problem with the governments is that you'll find. I mean, we've got our Australian chief scientist. It's an official position. He doesn't buy the replication crisis. He doesn't think there's a problem. Mm. Uh, so we've got to get it out there that there really is a problem. We've got to get it into the media that there really is a problem. And it's getting out there. It's slowly but surely getting out there. We're going to win. Yeah, and we have to go all angles. That's the other thing I tell people. Like you have to really attack it from all possible angles. Um, and so, well, that's great. Anything else you wanted to uh, cover? No, or, that's uh, right. Any other positive news you could maybe finish on a more positive, other positive news or positive developments? <laughs> Well, well, I'm actually very optimistic about the whole problem. I, I compared with what I when I first started to read the literature on replication problems, I literally went into depression because I thought I'm part of a a, a group, a, a profession which is just utterly untrustworthy. But as time has gone on, and, I, and I'm seeing, you know, a whole group of people in North Queensland here, a whole group of the politicians are seeing a problem. And, and they may not like precisely the solution that I'm proposing, but they, they understand where, what we've got to do and what we, where we've got to go. It's just a question of how we do it rather than if we do it. I'm now far more optimistic about ultimately uh, solving this problem than I was a few years ago, no doubt. Huh. Well, that's great. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, this is great. I mean, we should uh, think of, Oh, actually, going back to the debate, I guess, maybe, um, did you hear anything else about, did anything else shake out in terms of your opponent who never, or canceled? No, or they, no, so we invited them to a debate on the on five major questions about the Great Barrier Reef, and they wouldn't show up. Um, they're, so, they're so unsure of their science. I mean, there were simple questions. How much coral has been killed by mud running off farms? You know, how much coral has been killed by pesticides? What have the coral growth rates done in the last hundred years? Right? There are simple questions which they're blaming farmers for these things, and they wouldn't show up to a debate. And there was no uh, other feasible no explanation. Debates. There was no other. Uh, uh, they said oh, it wasn't an appropriate forum, right? Appropriate forum. <laughs> but they're just chicken, basically. Uh, they they know that uh, when they're up against uh, an opponent who knows what they're talking about, who now they can't control the exclusion, their peer group has been unable to exclude this person. So the idea is you walk away. Huh. And are you planning other debates with other? Oh, yeah. Well, in the next, um, probably not in the next few months, uh, but uh, over the next year, yes, we're going to continue to push them. Uh, there's enough political pressure uh, to keep pushing them and they're going to have to front up sooner or later. Yeah, and I'm actually thinking the same. I mean, I'm just beginning and, you know, it's it's uh, it's kind of ambitious, but um, even if people decline interviews, that can be telling. And so I was talking to a collaborator and, and because th this is part of the other general culture shift that we need to see in academia is uh, a, a better ability to debate with your opponents in a civilized, constructive okay. way, uh, yep. and and so I I'm gonna try to now that my hardware is set up and um, try to get debates with you know critics of transparency, critics of replication. You know it's it's gonna be hard to get people to agree, but again, e even just publicizing people who are declining, uh, and then maybe 
you know, just finding uh, other people who are more moderate. It, it doesn't matter, but but we need uh, debate. And again, in science, the moment you stop questioning or debating, well, you're, you're clearly yeah. uh, not doing science. And, and people understand that. So it was very eye-opening to a lot of people in North Queensland when these institutions refused to debate. The first question they ask you is, well, what are they scared of? Um, what are they hiding? Um, so you sort of win. <laughs> you win the debate because the other side forfeited. I mean, I still want them to show up, and ultimately they're going to be forced to. Um, but, yes, I think, Etienne, you should you should be asking the Canadian chief scientist or whatever he's called, you know, what do you think of replication crisis? What should we be doing about this? Are you sure that all the work that's been used by the, the Canadian government um, on all sorts of public uh, issues is really based on the best possible science, given that the replication crisis is saying that 50% of peer-reviewed work could well be wrong? Oh, actually, so Get him on your show. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a, a good idea. And actually, on that front, so uh, I don't know that much about the Australian funding age. Well, you told me about their... Uh, their disinterest in replication, but what about open access and, and other transparency uh, movements? How, how, what are their status on that? Uh, I think there's a general, uh, the Australian Research Council is fairly good on that, um, trying to insist on, you know, all the data is put up and, and that type of stuff. So they're reasonably good on that. But do they, they check, are, right? Um, yeah, I doubt it. And do I, they have a yeah. system where you can actually search the resulting publications of funded grants. I, I doubt it. Right. Doubt and so it. that's what yeah. we argue is that, yeah, sure, they've been talking about open access and open data since actually I even found something from 2004, <laughs> actually even 1990s, um, depending how you define it. And, uh, and yeah, they still don't check. So they just assume, they just they make it a requirement. Okay, open access is a requirement. But they don't check, they don't audit. And we now know from yeah. meta scientific evidence uh, that compliance is low. Uh, because again, if yeah. people like they're on to the next, their 10th publication, uh, uh, you know, they're not going to do something that they can't really be penalized on. Uh, right. But we want to go further uh, with open data. And, um, and again, there are some issues, like you, you do have valid exemptions sometimes. But again, uh, it's better to check and be able to confirm that you did not share data at this one specific time because of a valid exemption rather than not knowing at all whether the data is missing, yeah. the data is unreliable, or you're just actually hiding something, right? Uh, and then the system works for different article types. Of course, if there's no new data reported, then you know data is relevant. But again, like if there's a will, there's a way. We can develop the system. I, I tell people if accounts, uh, and I used to have uh, a friend who was an actual accountant. She was an auditor, uh, and she was kind of uh, early inspirations. Um, though back then I, I still wasn't into meta science. Uh, but I tell mm -hmm. people you should see how complicated a financial audit is in terms of the yeah. different accounts and the different aspects of a corporation that needs to be checked. This is grossly simpler uh, to design, even though it is challenging. Uh, you know, you have different article types, you have different studies, you can debate how, how detailed does the data set have to be. But these are all problems that can be solved if, if there's a will and there's a commitment that transparency is not optional. Every publicly funded researcher has to meet it, period. You just, you make it happen. Um, there's another group in psychology uh, who use an analogy with food labeling, which is a great one to mention, where yeah. a food nutritional label, uh, when the government started talking about it, the industry, rightfully, uh, industry should push back, but they argued something similar to what these anti-transparency yeah. researchers are arguing, is that, oh, yeah. it's going to slow down the science, it's going to be too much red tape, it's going to uh, disproportionately affect certain products, certain fields, right? But the argument was, well, it's better to have an imperfect nutritional label system uh, and, and check compliance than no nutritional labels at all, right? And that's what yeah. we're arguing. We, it's better to have an imperfect, yeah. incomplete system than no system at all. Uh, because again, right. if, you, if you at least perceive that there's a chance you might 
even just you know get some flack on Twitter, then your behavior changes, right? But if there's no punishment, uh, then your behavior doesn't change. Yeah. Good. All right. Well, thanks for doing this. Good. It's important that you, the taxpayer, engage with the videos to increase their visibility. So please like or dislike videos, leave a comment regarding points of clarification or other issues or topics you'd like us to cover. Leave comments pointing out any inaccuracies, mischaracterizations, errors. Finally, please consider making a donation so we can continue to create videos and achieve our goals of reforming research standards in academia. You can make a donation on our Patreon page, link to my left, or by making a one-time PayPal donation, link in the video description. Thank you.